You guys are far too kind. Thank you. Uh, what can I say? It's lo lovely to be adored by your team. And uh, yeah, uh, hey, it is uh, so, so, so exciting and such a privilege. Uh, I can't remember how long ago it was. It was maybe kind of 10, uh, maybe 10 years or so ago. Um, I went to one of these kind of industry conferences where they always have a bunch of different speakers. And to be honest, they're not always the most engaging and enigmatic of speakers. And there was this kind of new kind of a emerging person, which probably, again, would, would, would date it, um, and uh, called Martin Lewis, and this money-saving expert. And he got up and he spoke from the stage. And I was absolutely captivated as I sat there and personally it felt like it was probably the most engaging communicator I've ever sat and listened to. Sorry, John. Um, <laughs> and uh, as he talked about money and debt and finance and yeah, it was just absolutely amazing. And uh, yeah, now gone on to be called all sorts of many different things, including the most trusted voice in the UK. It's so, so, so exciting, Martin, to have you here. You are, without a doubt, our biggest advocate out there. The, the people that come to us to get help, uh, you are the biggest voice that kind of sends people to us, which is just amazing for them, most importantly, and really, really great and exciting. I do want to say a big hello. Um, there are people hopefully watching on Facebook Live. Um, and uh, if you are watching on Facebook Live, we want to confirm this is the real Martin Lewis, okay? <laughs> He's not advertising cap, okay? Because Martin doesn't do adverts, okay? <laughs> we just want to make that extremely clear. This is not an advert, okay? It is uh, Martin who has very, very generously said he would give some of his time to come up and speak to you, um, our staff. And so you don't want to hear me say another word. Let's uh, once again give a massive Christians Against Poverty welcome to the amazing Martin Lewis. Martin, come on up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you for talking about my communication skills. And <laughs> I'm really pleased to be here. What I'd like to talk to you about today. <laughs> I'm not very happy to be here. If I had my dream, I wouldn't be here. I'd shut you down. I'd shut you down in a second. I do not want Christians Against Poverty to exist. I wish that I were better at my day job of trying to help people be better with their money and help prevent the problems that they have. I wish that my Money and Mental Health Policy Institute was better at changing policy out there so there were less people with mental health problems who were stuck in crisis debt. But I'm not that good. Thankfully, though, you are. So I'm delighted to be here among some true life savers. Now, people always think when you talk about saving lives and money, they think it's hyperbole, they think it's exaggeration. Now, if I've come to any room where people will know it is true, it is here. Finance is not just some arcane bit of the accounts. It affects the roof over your head. It affects your relationship. It affects whether you can talk and look after your children properly. It affects your mental health status. It is one of the biggest causes of suicide. It is one of the biggest causes of divorce in this country. And it's about time we stop saying, I'm not good with money, as if it's some type of boast. It's about time we started talking about money, being better with money, and actually learning to have a form of pride of being able to deal with your money. There are very few other areas of self-sufficiency where people seem to boast when they are bad at it. Well, they boast that they're bad with money. And unfortunately, the knock-on effect is we encourage others to think, oh, there's not much I can do about it. Well, there's a lot you can do about it. Again, I wish you weren't here, because you pick up the pieces. Let's not break it in the first place. That would be the right solution. But you are here. You do an amazing job. You know, and, and John and I have talked many times. You'll know, you've heard me on the telly say it many times. If you're in debt crisis, there's nothing I can say here on TV or on radio or write that is anything close to going to a one-on-one -on -one debt counselling agency. 
Citizens Advice Bureau, National Debt Line, uh, Step Change, they are great. But I do differentiate, and this is a nuance that we have between John and I of when I go, because for me, those organisations are great for someone who needs a service provider to help them go through their issues. You know, a bit like seeing an accountant or a lawyer, hi, I need some advice, let's have a formal meeting, we'll sit across a table, I'm in a good frame of mind to be able to work out my problems, and they are great at that. They give far less hours than you do per individual. And actually, I think that's a good streamlining method. But I do tend to know, sadly, that marriage made in hell of mental health and debt. You are four times more likely to be in debt crisis if you have a mental health problem than anybody else. It's said the clinical treatment time for depression is exacerbated by 18 months. It's 18 months longer for those people who have a financial problem than for those who don't. These are symbiotic problems. They feed off each other. And so the idea, I first wrote my guide to mental health and debt back in 2007. And at the time, when I, I wrote it and I published it, and it was a PDF, and you could order a book if you wanted, and we sent it around to NHS places, the, my, my big statement was, if you've got mental health and debts, you're not special. You're not extraordinary. You're not the one. And so many people came back and said, I thought it was just me. But we know it's not. We know it's going to be a very interesting debate politically over the next decade. Because we're doing, and this isn't final yet, so we're doing work on this at the moment. But we think it is likely the majority of people who have bailiffs to their door have a mental health problem. Now, currently... The policy is biased that you don't have a mental health problem and you need to declare your vulnerability. But actually, now we have got over the tipping point where it's over 50%. Do we have to start having a policy change over crisis debt where we make the assumption that you have the mental health problem rather than the other way around? And that is a very, very difficult thing for society to deal with it. I'm not quite sure how we will do so. It's something that we're going to be looking at in the Policy Institute. I mean, one of the things we've been putting in is when people go, it's, they ask about your relationship, they ask everything about when you're going for mental health counselling, when you're doing a CBT, they weren't asking about your finances. Do they not realise that one of the things that stops people sleeping at night, that keeps them worried, that leaves them panicking how they'll bring up their children is financial issues. And it is a lot cheaper, frankly, you are cheaper than psychiatrists. No offence, I've heard what John pays you. You're a lot cheaper <laughs> than psychiatrists. But there's a point, there's a real point behind that. There are lots of wonderful people, psychiatrists, psychologists, counsellors, social workers, uh, mental health caseworkers, who spend a lot of their time going through forms and helping people budget. They're not qualified to do so. They may do it very well. But that isn't an efficient way to operate our society. What we need is let's get people who are really good with money and do it every day to help with the money. And let's get the people who are great with mental health to help with the mental health. And we need to filter when you go through a mental health casework to work out where you're going to come out the back end. And try and say, you know what? I see you've got financial problems too, says your psychiatrist. There's a wonderful debt counselling agency, even if it's not CAP. It doesn't matter, right? There's a wonderful non-profit debt counselling agency who can go through this with you and start to ease the pressure that, that way. Let's work in concert. And that is the society that we need to start living in going future. And that's something that I'm committed to working on with MMHPI, which some of you will have hopefully heard of. It's been going two years. It's done wonderful work. You know, the, you can really make change. Not, it, it was a big one for me. I, when I set it up, I wrestled. Because what I'd love to do is, obviously, as you do, help everybody with a mental health problem and debt issues. Well, it's virtually impossible. We can't. So instead, I decided to focus on the policy, small policy change, little ones, the money and mental health debt evidence form. We discovered one in three people were being charged to by their GP to have that form signed. So there you are in crisis debt. You've got a mental health issue and you want to tell your lender, I've got a mental health issue. You go to your GP, you have no money, you're in crisis debt. And they say, sure, that'll be 100 pounds. Some said 30 was the average, but some over 100 pounds. That's just not the society I want to live in. And we have a promise now from the Prime Minister to sort it out. We'll see how much that promise is worth. 
But those are the type of issues. And I actually don't think there is a bad guy. It's nice to think life is, is about good and bad. I don't think there was a bad guy here. I think there was a structural problem. The GPs aren't wrong. They just say we charge for everything that isn't on our NHS contract. The lenders aren't wrong. They work together to get the form to try and make it easier for people. The individuals aren't wrong. I'm into crisis debt. Nobody ever looked at this before. And we have a wonderful user base of bringing it forward. And if ever you find something that's wrong with the system, because you do great work, I know, for individuals that let us know with Money and Mental Health Policy Institute and we'll try and raise it. And then the wonderful victory we had last week, which I'm so proud of, I don't know if any of you heard of it, with all the shenanigans going on with me and Facebook and Question Time and all that type of stuff, my, the thing I'm most proud of that's happened in the last couple of weeks, I should say, is that the government accepted the amendment we've been working on about, you know about breathing space, people here know, the six weeks, not long enough, but it'll do for to start. So start, the six weeks that you now get well, the government accepted our amendment for what we call recovery space that says anybody who is in uh, hospitalised due to a mental health crisis or in NHS mental health crisis in the community care automatically gets breathing space without asking for it. That's a big win. That's a big win. Because when you hear people, you have to laugh. I mean, sometimes it rolls around so far, all we can do is laugh. People who have been in hospital for over a month due to an anxiety, anxiety condition, getting home to find bailiffs at their door, all you can do is laugh because otherwise you will be in tears on the floor. And that's why we campaign for recovery space, because you're great when you press the button but if I'm in hospital due to my mental health issues, I can't make that call. I won't be thinking to make that call. And that way we've said to them, the bias has to be, give it to all of them. Yes, there might be 30 or 40% of people who don't have a debt problem at that time. So what? Give it to all of them. It doesn't matter. We do that as a matter of course. Because that is the hallmark and the benchmark of living in a legitimate civil society of a democratised country that cares. So, that's the good stuff. I'm going to do a little bit of the slightly stuff, because it's important. So when I tweeted I was coming here today, you know I'm very vocally supporting of, of uh, Christians Against Poverty. I put my hand in my pocket on occasion too as well, uh, even as a good Jewish boy. So it all works well. <laughs> That wasn't meant to be the not putting my hand in my pocket. That was meant to be about the Christians Against Poverty. Let's not go there. Uh, rewind. Now, you know I've often supported Christians. I won't do it again. So when I tweeted I was coming here today, as I've had before, some people said this is a proletizing organization that shouldn't be allowed. So let's handle this and let's be really open. Now, first of all, I've said to John before, I wish there was a Jews against poverty, a Muslims against poverty, and a Hindus against poverty. Uh, it's something I'm talking about within in, in, uh, the Jewish community, that we should be doing more, and there are Jews in poverty. You know, it's the myth that Jews, every Jew is rich. I'm sure you know it's a myth. It's not right. There are many Jews who live in poverty, and we should be doing something there too. But, of course, Christians Against Poverty isn't about helping Christians. Christians Against Poverty is about helping people. And the drive, the reason you do it, some of it, for some of you, I'm sure not everyone, is your Christianity and your faith. And I will never knock that, because I think that's right. And the most important thing is the enormous number of results. And every time I mention Christians Against Poverty, I get people who tell me how it's changed their lives. And I get far more of those than who knock the proletizing. But of course, from my perspective, there's a balance. There has to be a balance. It has to be the reason you do it. it. has to be because you want to help people, not because automatically you want to make everybody follow in your faith in the way that it operates. And as long as that balance is held and respect for other people's leaf, beliefs, and that a no is a no, and if someone, no one vulnerable person is taken advantage of, which I don't believe you do, then I, not as a member of your faith, will continue to support you with every ounce of being that I have because you are doing good. And I don't care 
whether you wear a Christian hat or a Jewish hat or an agnostic hat or a secular hat, if you are doing good, you should be lauded and supported, acclaimed and applauded. And I will do all of those things. Now, where are we? Where are we at the moment was the next point. We're in a really interesting time because people are talking about the economy starting and beginning to recover. Now, what's interesting, and I think there's probably some truth in that. What's interesting, though, is people's real financial problems don't necessarily flow within the economic cycles. They tend to lag. They tend to be a little bit behind. One of the great challenges we're going to face over the next five years is something I've been warning about for the last five years, which still hasn't happened yet, but will happen, which is what I call the mortgage ticking time bomb. This is something to be aware of. Pre-credit crunch. You see, right now, everybody says mortgages are really cheap. Yeah, mortgage is dirt cheap. Not quite true. This is the problem. Pre-credit crunch, the difference between your standard variable rate and the base rates was maybe 1%, 1.5%. Now, the difference between the base rate and your standard variable rate is 3 to 3.5%. So the margin of standard rates has got much bigger. And many more people are on standard rates because these days you can't have a 100% mortgage. These days we have much tougher affordability scores that sometimes bizarrely even say you can't afford a cheaper mortgage because they assess you when you're remortgaging as, as if you were doing a new mortgage but don't take into account you've already got a mortgage and it would be the same debt. So surely it would, you could afford a mortgage at 3% when you can't afford one at 5%, but that's how it works. Hey. <laughs> um, or you're a mortgage prisoner or you were a self-cert mortgage. So there are many more people on standard variable rates than used to be, and the gap is bigger. So while people pay less for their mortgages because UK interest rates are lower, the actual margin on mortgages are bigger. Now, if we went back to the old normal, I can see some very young faces in here. So let me tell you now, this is not normal. Interest rates are not low. They are limboing way beneath the prior 200-year lowest we have ever had. They are, and this is the anomaly. This is the strange time. This is the weird bit. And it's always very difficult to acknowledge that you live in an anomaly and to live in a strange time. So let's say mortgage rates went back to the old normal. Let's say they go back to 4%. UK interest rates go back to 4%. Well, if we don't see a substantial reduction in the mortgage margins, people are going to be paying 7 or 8% on their mortgages. And people have not budgeted for that. And that is simply unaffordable for many people in the country. Now, I first wrote on this, it's got to have been 2009 when I first wrote that we have to do some policy to address these mortgage margins before interest rates start to go back up. And of course, each year that they don't go back up, each year everybody gets more inured to it and thinks this is fine and it's not a problem because mortgages are cheap. Well, interest rates are seemingly starting to move upward now on a slow trajectory, but it is a big problem to face. And I predict over the next five or 10 years, you will have many more people sitting in front of you devastated because they thought their life was sorted, they thought they'd done their planning right and everything was on track. But their mortgages are way more expensive than they used to be. They can't afford it. And that most terrible thing, we all know what causes debt. It's overspending, isn't it? It's not overspending. It's overspending. That's why they're all in debt. Feckless. Feckless they are. Feckless, especially you. <laughs> right? It's, it's those three words. The most devastating three words for anybody's finances. Change of circumstance. That's why many people are in crisis debt. Your mental health, you lose your job, you get divorced, your partner dies, you lose your leg. All of it. And change of circumstances and mortgage rates are going to drive more people into your arms over the next few years, I'm sorry to say. So you have to be prepared for that one going forward. So, you know, hopefully the economy will upturn. Hopefully it'll be good for some people, but there's always a knock-on effect. And as we know, it just changes the flavor of what we deal with. 
Funnily enough, before we had the credit crunch, the biggest thing on, on, on my site was, was about debt. Then we had it, and everyone said, oh, there's be loads of people in debt. The biggest thing on my site has been on savings ever since 2007 because savers are once really struggling to get decent interest rates. It's not the way that people perceive it. We come out of a downturn, and actually we could end up with more, not less people in debt crisis, and that's what we have to watch for. Now, if I've got five more minutes, I want to play a game with you before I finish. Okay, so this is a fun game, and I've always wanted to do this with such an educated audience. Because <laughs> originally this was designed for 15-year-olds. Okay? This game is called, and there's a reason I am doing this. It's, 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 this is for me, so you but just go with it. This is, this is called my good debt, bad debt game. So if it's good debt, you say it's good debt. If it's good debt, you say... And if it's bad debt, you say bad debt. If it's bad debt, you say... And this is how one of the ways that I teach 15-year-olds if I talk to them about how money works. So I'm going to ask you a series of three questions. At the end, you're going to tell me whether they're good or bad debt. Okay, you ready? <laughs> oh, God, what if I get it wrong? I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> Please, John, don't look at me. <laughs> you turn the cameras on them. I've been saving up to buy a house, me and the family. We've been renting for a long time, and we've managed to get a 10% deposit together, and we're going to get a five-year fixed rate that we know we can afford. It's actually going to be cheaper than our current rent. It's a place for us to live for the long term. It's not a speculative investment. And uh, we're really looking forward to it because we've been planning this for a long time. Good debt, bad debt? Of course. But did you hear what you just said? You said good and debt. What happened to neither a borrower nor a lender be? <laughs> well, what happened to it is society changed. If you want to get a house, unless you're incredibly fortunate, you are going to have to borrow. If you want to go to university, you are going to have to get what we, wrongly, call a loan. <laughs> And therefore, we have to accept as a society, it is no longer about don't borrow. It is about only borrow when it's right for you and make sure it's good debt. So you said good debt. Correct. Question number two. <laughs> <laughs> I've just seen a holiday <laughs> to Jamaica. <laughs> It cost £10,000, and I earn £5,000 a year. <laughs> but the payday loan company, oh, they've said they'll lend me the money at only 10% interest an hour. <laughs> Good debt, bad debt. Thank you very much. Now, let's not get me wrong here. I'm not saying all debt is good. It is about learning when it's right or wrong to borrow. Debt, if it's an investment as a one-off of a planned purchase for your future that is necessary now, can be a good thing. Borrowing when it's willy-nilly to fill the gaps or on an impulse and there's nothing you're going to have from it is bad. And we need to ad advocate and educate beforehand when it is right or when it is wrong to borrow. So, of course... That is bad debt. Question three, the last question. I lost my job six months ago. It's been tough for us and the kids and the family. We've really been struggling. I work in a city. I've been applying for everything. But you know what? These last six months, I've used up all my savings. I've got nothing left. I've just managed to get a job. But the job is in the countryside. Unfortunately, we've managed, we've managed to find a decent place to live. You know, we're going to rent somewhere. But unfortunately, my work is six miles in that direction. And my kid's school is seven miles in that, that direction. And before you get smart, one has a dodgy knee so we can't cycle. <laughs> so we're going to need to get a car. We never had one before. We were in the city. We took public transport. There is no public transport where I'm going to live. The cheapest car I can find that's going to be reliable, it's not smart or fancy, is £2,000. But it should get us there without needing too much fixing up. 
But unfortunately, as I've been out of work and I've got no savings, I'm going to have to borrow to get it. And my credit score isn't good because I've been out of work. The cheapest loan I can get is 20% APR. That is going to push me to the brink of my budget. But if I don't get the car, I can't get the job. However, the job has a three-month probationary period. Mm -hmm. A three-month probationary period. So if I get the car, I can afford it. I get to three months and they let me go. I'm going bankrupt. I've had it. It's over. But if I don't get the car, I can't get the job. And if the job goes well, I might have a chance. They might give me a pay rise after a while and things could get better. Good debt, bad debt. Not as loud this time, are you? (laughs) So what we're going to (laughs) do. So what we're going to do. We're going to give you a couple of minutes to think about this. Well, I have a sip of my water. I think it's just, is that that? Down there? Uh, and then you go, oh, it's up here. And then you're going to do show of hands, okay? But what you're going to do is I'm going to make you close all your eyes when you do show of hands. <laughs> so you can't see what John does. Right, you've had time, you've had time to think about it. Okay. <laughs> Finished. Okay, right. Eyes closed, everybody. Eyes closed. If you can see me now, you're cheating. Shh, 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 shh. Hands up if it's good debt. Hands up if it's bad debt. I would say, you can open your eyes now. Hello. I would say you were 60% bad debt, 40% good debt, including John. (laughs) No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, you're done. Resign. Uh, 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 So, 60-40, which is really interesting because what I tend to find is the older the audience, the more they tend to be pro-good debt. The younger, the more they think it's bad debt. If you do it for 15-year-olds, they're almost universally bad debt because life is black and white, just don't borrow. And Would you like to know the official Martin Lewis money-saving expert answer to that question? Yeah. It's grey debt, somewhere between good and bad. <laughs> so, so, I know I get to set the question. <laughs> the first time someone's brought a little devil into Christians Against Poverty. There we go. So, but let's think about this for a second. The reason this question is so important, and the reason it's so important to 15-year-olds and all of us, is because life is not about black and white. It's not about saying don't spend. It is about making decisions, and it's about making decisions based on the most difficult thing that we have to deal with that we're not taught in schools and we're not taught anywhere else. And that difficult thing that we have to deal with is the word uncertainty. Now, there are many things in life that are uncertain. People ask me, should I get a fix on my mortgage? I can tell you how to make the decision. I can't tell you if it'll be right for you in the long run. Should I get my euros now or wait till summer? I don't know. You're an expert. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. They're too expensive. So the whole point of this is uncertainty. Should I marry him or her? I don't know. All you can do is plan for the best and hope for the worst. Has anyone got a coin just quickly? Has anyone got a coin on them? Don't worry, you'll get it back. <laughs> Maybe. Here you are. Right, so what's your name? Simon. Simon. So you're going to play this game with me, Simon. I'm going to prove a point. <laughs> well done. So I've got a coin here. Here we go. So let's imagine I'm going to offer you a bet. I'm not. <laughs> now on this bet, it's heads and tails, your coin, so it's fair. If I win, you have to give me a pound. He doesn't. If you win, I'll give you a hundred pounds. I won't. (laughs) Right? Would you take that bet? Is that a good bet? Heads or tails, I'll give you 100 quid if you win, you give me a pound if you you do. Yeah, it's not real. So let's do it. Call it. It's all gone wrong. Call it. It's tails. Was it a bad bet? No. It was a bad outcome. It was a good decision. It was a bad outcome. Now, in life, what we do is we confuse good and bad outcomes with good and bad decisions. It's very easy to see in a binary option over tossing a coin. 
There are still people who tell me, oh, I got it really badly wrong. 2006, I fixed my mortgage for five years at 7%. Worst decision I ever made. No. Good decision. If you fixed because you wanted security of knowing what you were going to pay for the next five years, you made a good decision. You had a bad outcome. And if we can't learn to differentiate between bad outcomes and bad decisions, that leads to real bad decisions in future. We become too risk averse. We have confirmation bias. We sit there and go, that happened to me before. It will happen again. We can't make our life decisions and always get them right. Should I marry him or her? You may have loved each other. It may have been absolutely perfect for you two to be together. You went, you were in love, you had children. It was all going incredibly well. Some externality changed one of you or the other and it was no longer meant to be. You couldn't stick together. That wasn't happiness. It wasn't good for the kids. There were too many arguments going on. Did you make a bad decision? No, you had a bad outcome. And in all areas of our lives, we need to learn to differentiate between the two. Good decisions, good outcomes. Sometimes bad decision can be a good outcome and a good decision can be a bad one. And it's only by realizing that we actually become more comfortable with ourselves. We make better decisions in future. We don't beat ourselves up. We lower the anxiety and we live a happier life. And actually, one of the best decisions people can make, if they're there, if they're struggling with their finances, if they're hurting and not knowing where to go, is to Christians Against Poverty. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> yeah, uh, brilliant, Martin. Uh, inspirational. And yeah, good to challenge some thinking and uh, good for me to know that I'm still young because I voted bad debt. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but um, hey, uh, we as a charity, there are a number of things that, you know, we do really, really well. And one of the things that we have brought to the money advice sector is the whole arena of monitoring and celebrating people actually getting themselves debt free and actually out of debt. It's not something that happens widely. Um, more people are following our lead, which is absolutely brilliant and wonderful. Um, just uh, last week, we had a stunning week for us. You know, you know, we don't help loads and loads of people like the big players like Step Change do. We saw 74 families um, go debt free just last week, which is amazing. <laughs> absolutely fantastic. <clears throat> and... Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, I know any of our supporters that may be watching online um, should be aware of this, but we celebrate people going debt-free. We used to do this for every person that went debt-free, we just can't do it anymore because there's just too many, where we actually blow a harmonica um, to uh, kind of celebrate them going uh, debt-free, a big Mexican wave happening and all that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, I guess really in acknowledgement of all the people that have gone debt-free because of your referral to us and your, we, um, John's got a little something that he wants to uh, present to you to take back to your office and uh, to have your very own personally engraved <laughs> harmonica. This <laughs> is great. And uh, yeah, we have, uh, we've got a debt-free celebration that we've uh, made sure gets delayed until Martin's there so you can join in, blow the harmonica, enjoy the Mexican wave. And um, yeah, uh, we, we, we're not going to do Q&A because we want to have time to I spoke for too long. <laughs> it was a good outcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we want to be able to show him kind of like where you guys do the hard work that sees the, the thousands of people getting the help that they do. Of course, we, what we can't show him is the front line, the people going into people's homes. We all know that they are real heroes of ours, don't they? And many of them will be watching online. We just want to honor them and celebrate them for the amazing job they do, sitting down in the homes of often very needy, vulnerable people, bringing that hope, bringing that help to everyone. And, yeah, kind of like sensitively holding the whole faith thing in the, in the right way as well, which is really, really great and fantastic. So um, I think uh, we've got him in the building. Let's just rise to our feet one more time. Just one more huge thank you to Martin. Then we'll be off, off on our tour. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Excellent. So, if you want to go back to your desk, remember we told you you need to look busy. Um, you need to look clever. Um, so those of you that have been sent out for a walk, that's not good news. Um, but yeah, we'll be bringing Marcy around showing you about everything that's going on. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, Cap.